All right, this is chapter seven, section three, or at least the first half of chapter seven, section three, but we're going to just really talk about Napoleon and the beginning of his empire. So, um, early life, Napoleon Bonaparte, he's born in Corsica. He is this French hero and he's not even actually French. If you look at this map, you can see that, uh, Corsica, which is north of Sardinia, sort of, is uh, in between, almost almost equal distance between France and Italy, and has been fought over by both of them for so long. Um, now, the people of Corsica don't consider themselves French, and they don't consider themselves Italian, even though that at alternate times they've been owned by both. They consider themselves Corsican. But at the time we're talking about, Corsica is owned by France. Um, the Bonapartes are a fairly well-off family and um, Napoleon's father works for the French government and he attends military school. He is obsessed with the military. Um, he's got a crazy strong and very influential mother, especially on the Bonaparte children. She leads them all to this, this uh, belief that they are capable of great things, that they are possible of great things, therefore they are expected to do great things. Now, of course, no one succeeds as well as, as her boy Napoleon. Um, he eventually joins the army and uh, does so well that he gets a scholarship to a military academy, a very prestigious French military academy. But when he's there, he's the scholarship kid. The rest of them are, are you know, wealthy kids who've paid their way in. But he is the scholarship kid and he's not even French. He's Corsican. So he gets bullied quite a bit and he has a lot to prove. While he's there, he shows a genius for using cannons in um, battles, in battle planning in new, ingenious, and very creative ways. So, in 1794, Napoleon is called by the National Convention to defend them. Now, they had called someone else ahead of time. That person had shown up and said, uh, you know, another general, and said, I am not going to fire on French citizens, even though they're royalists attacking the convention, but he refused to fire on them. They called Napoleon up, and he has no problem firing on them, and does. And so he's considered the, uh, the, the protector of the revolution, the National Convention, even though most people are fed up with the National Convention because they haven't really been doing anything. Um, so the National Convention gives Napoleon command of forces in Italy. And in Italy, Napoleon is um, fighting against uh, Austria and their allies. And he does amazingly well. He seems to have this like crazy battlefield magic. He goes charging into the battlefield, leading his troops, yelling the sort of, you know, cliched, follow me men. And, you know, across a bridge, which is basically like a death trap. And yet he never gets hit. And so his men think he's you know, this magical being who can, you know, wander straight into the battle and not get hit. And they follow him anywhere because he goes. He, he goes at the front of the battle. He's ready to fight. He has incredible loyalty amongst his men, and that's going to be important later. So anyways, he's winning all these victories in Italy. And in France, he's a hero. Um, and, you know, while he's there... And he is conquering these areas and, and taking, uh, taking over these areas. He literally brings the French Revolution to the people that he's conquered. He's, uh, by 1797, he's conquered most of northern Italy for France. And he's got to administer these areas. And he brings them all the benefits of the French Revolution. He gets rid of old religious orders and serfdom, limits noble privilege, brings liberty and equality to the people. So they get all the benefits of the French Revolution without all the messy guillotine and beheadings and such. The Egyptian campaign. So in 1798, after, you know, being so awesome in Italy, they give him another campaign in Egypt. Um, they send him down to Egypt and say, okay, go harass, you know, go harass the British. Um, because if you remember from our last set of notes, the British had started attacking France. So they said, you know, go get, go get them. Go take care of them and go get them in one of their favorite colonies. Go get them in Egypt. And that's where he goes. And um, he has a couple of battles and we're not going to get into them. Uh, but his main person that he's fighting against is a guy named Admiral Horatio Nelson, who is the admiral for the British fleet. And um, they fight each other back and forth. And it's almost become sort of like a personal vendetta because 
Napoleon has a lot of personal drama right at this point. Before he leaves for Italy, um, he marries uh, a woman named Josephine, who happens to be a widow with two kids. Her husband was um, a little, you know, little known nobility, and he was killed during the terror. So here she is, this widow with two kids, and she's trying to make her way in the world. And um, she's been sort of hooking up with uh, various rich guys who will support her and her kids so they're not ending up homeless in the streets and when she meets napoleon napoleon falls hard like crazy like just google napoleon's love letters to josephine i mean some of them are uh will make you blush and others you're just like dude get a life um either way so he marries josephine um before he leaves for italy and so most every day he writes Josephine, please come to Italy. Please come to Italy. I love you. I love you. I love you. Um, she doesn't write back. <laughs> she doesn't write back because she's too busy living it up with her new boyfriend and partying and she doesn't love him. So while he's in Egypt, he, um, you know, continues to write her, but he gets the sort of, you know, the bro notice from his brother who says, you know, nobody wants to tell you, but I think you should know you know, Josephine has this boyfriend and she's been living with him and everyone knows. And so Napoleon has this meltdown and he writes her this letter of how horrible it is. And I think I'm trying to remember the exact words, but I think he calls her a beastly slut. (laughs) Um, and, but then, you know, as he's like pouring in all this hatred into this Josephine letter, he also writes his brother and does the kind of like, I can't believe she, (laughs) she hurt me like this. I love her so bad. Why does she do this? You know, that kind of, broken hearted uh, message to his brother now of course um all of this gets dumped in the mail and the mail bag gets thrown onto a ship to go back to france and this ship actually happens to get captured by admiral nelson and of course they're going to go through the mail because they're going to want to see if there's you know any um anything about troop movements or what the what the french are planning or anything like that if there's any important communiques and of course they happen to catch the ship that has these letters on it. And so Nelson gets great joy out of sending these letters to the London Times and having these letters published in the London newspaper. So there is very much a personal hatred between Napoleon and Nelson, and all of England is laughing at Napoleon. Um, so anyways, so uh, other than just that personal salt in the wound, there's also the fact that uh, Admiral Nelson defeats Napoleon. Napoleon loses and the French fleet is destroyed at the Battle of the Nile. The British are victorious, the French lose. Now what? Well, before we get on to what happens after that, I want to point out just some little footnote in history that you should know. Um, Napoleon liked to travel with um, historians and scholars, which is why when he was in Italy, if you've ever wondered why the Louvre has so many Italian masters, you know, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, etc. Why all those Italian artists are in the Paris Museum and not in a museum in Italy is because as Napoleon's rolling through Italy, he's gathering up all this amazing art and shipping it back to Paris. Um, when he's in Egypt, his scholars discover some Bedouins using this big, huge chunk of rock, a black rock called basalt, and they're cooking on it. It's a big, heavy rock, and it, it doesn't crack in the fire so they dump it on top of the fire heat it up and use it to cook on it like a kind of a grill and um uh, napoleon scholars recognize that there's writing on this there's interesting writing on this there's ancient greek on this and when they flip it over after it's you know cooled down they look there's ancient greek another type of writing which they could decipher and ancient hieroglyphics egyptian hieroglyphics which no one could decipher at that point and what they figure out what it is is it's literally just a bill of sale for goods it lists these all these goods and who bought them and where they're going etc but it does it repetitively in three different languages and the rosetta stone becomes the key to unlock hieroglyphics without the rosetta stone we would never be able to read ancient egyptian hieroglyphics we'd have no idea what's on any of those buildings any of the pyramids or anything, um, which is why that, you know, software is called Rosetta Stone because it, quote, unlocks languages for you. So meanwhile, um, Napoleon has to do a little damage control. He abandons his troops in Egypt. That is not cool. But because, um, you know, 
news does not move fast at this time. By the time he gets back to France, they have not heard of his really kind of crazy loss in Egypt. They just know he is the Napoleon of the National Convention. He is the Napoleon of, of the Italian campaign. He is the war hero, um, you know, extraordinaire. And so he returns home and he receives this hero's welcome. Now, of course, the first thing he does is go to find Josephine. He's going to you know, they're going to have a little talk. Uh, when he gets there, she's not there. He assumes she's out, you know, in the countryside with her boyfriend. Turns out she, um, somebody told her that uh, Napoleon's brother had ratted her out and um, and her cheating ways. And uh, she actually goes to go meet Napoleon, but she misses him. And, um, and so when she returns back to Paris and goes to their house, he's locked her out and thrown all her stuff out the window, you know, the bad breakup. And um, she, you know, screams and cries for a couple hours. And eventually, I guess he takes her back. So this is the, um, uh, the, the uh, states that were established by revolutionary France. So um, when they conquer areas that were Austria or Austrian or Prussian, this is, this is, this is France slowly expanding. So you can see that orange slowly expanding. So after stranding his troop in Egypt, um, Napoleon returns and learns from his brother that the national legislature is not very popular and hasn't done much and hasn't delivered on the promises of the revolution. And people are generally angry and getting irritated and, you know, there's talk of another revolution and what are we going to do? So he takes what's left of the troops that he still can command and he surrounds the national legislature and he kicks out most of the representatives calling them corrupt and and uh you know unworthy those that were left were encouraged by napoleon's brother who basically said if you don't do this my brother is outside with guns and they will shoot you so they were highly encouraged to vote um almost like the Committee of Public Safety, a small group of people to run the country, and they call themselves consuls, three consuls. Where do you get that name? Well, ancient Rome, of course. And Napoleon does a lot of things to try to remind people of the greatness of ancient Rome and to make them equate that with France. So um, they vote for three consuls, of which Napoleon is one and his brother is another. And then, of course, those other two guys gracefully bow out when Napoleon declares himself first consul, which is the same thing Caesar did. And then Napoleon does away with the elected representatives and appoints a Senate instead, which, of course, is packed with his friends and family. And in 1802, he takes the next step and makes himself sole consul for life. So he's basically just appointed himself dictator, and people are pretty happy about it. Now, as interesting as it is that he sort of seized power, you might even say illegally, but he has literally just seized power power is the democratic things that he keeps in France, the, um, uh, the, the democratic methodology he still hangs on to. So, for example, new constitution. Instead of just writing a new constitution being like, guess what, people? This is the new constitution. Love it. Here it is. He actually explains it and puts it up for a vote of the people. They actually had the ability to reject it. Um, a vote of the people is called a plebiscite. So he's keeping this this function of democracy, which keeps the people quite happy. Um, he does a lot of really good things. He fixes the economy. He sets up a national banking system. He sets up an official, uh, I'm sorry, an efficient tax collection. So money starts coming into the government to do things like services, like cleaning up Paris and fixing roads and doing the things people want. He establishes lyces, which are government-run public schools. Um, instead of just having schools that are run by the church, now they're run by the government, and you can be educated by the government and go get a job in the government. Um, he also returns Catholicism to the people of France, which makes a lot of people happy. And he has the uh, an agreement with the Pope called the Concordant. Here is um, Napoleon and the Pope having a disagreement, and you can see he's so... Um, emphatic he stood up and knocked over his chair and the pope looks a little resigned so what do you need to know about the concordant what well, was signed in 1801 catholicism was declared the religion of the majority of frenchmen but there's nothing in it that says you have to be catholic that would be going against the revolution the other interesting thing is is napoleon gets the pope to accept that all of the lands that were seized during the revolution will still belong to the french government the pope doesn't get those back um, he also gets the Pope to agree that bishops answer 
to the French government, not to the Pope. Now, eventually, when the Pope feels like he's got a little bit of wiggle room, Pope Pius the fifth, sixth, seventh is going to renounce the Concordant and say, basically, I didn't mean that. Sorry, <laughs> big mistake. Um, and Napoleon responds by inviting him to talk and then sort of having him placed under house arrest. Now, granted, it's a beautiful house out in the countryside and the Pope is not harmed in any way, but he can't leave. So he's sort of holding the Pope hostage. One of the best things that we chalk up to Napoleon is his code, um, the civil code of Napoleon. It divides civil law into personal status, property, and the acquisition of property. Its purpose is to finally get the French legal code to reflect everything the revolution promised. Napoleon is delivering on the ideals of the revolution. And that, you know, this one uniform law code for everybody, equal law code for everybody, is really, you know, one of the goals of the revolution. And, and that's one of the reasons historians argue of, did the French revolution end? with Napoleon? Or does it simply continue? Is he the next stage? Because he is bringing forth these revolutionary ideals. Here is an awesome painting showing you um, this is uh, Napoleon and his law code. And you can see he is there. And, and this is a, an amazing piece of propaganda because there he is. He's got his uniform on. He's got the French flag with him. He's got his overcoat and his, his hat there, you know, so he can pick up his stuff and go to war if he needs to. And, you know, it is very clear who, who is writing this code. It is Napoleon. He has pen in hand. He is writing it and he is staring you down right as we speak. He is looking at you. Do you see him? You see him? See him? He sees you. And he wants you to know that, you know, this wasn't a law code delivered by God. No, this was delivered by Napoleon. But he also wants you to know that God is pretty darn happy about it because, you know, God's got his, you know, or, or some prominent angel has got his arms thrown up like, holy mackerel, I can't believe you made this piece of awesome. And he's crowning him on the head with this laurel crown, showing that, you know, you're so awesome, I should crown you. Wherever this law code is implemented in countries that Napoleon conquers or con countries that Napoleon um, uh, allies himself with, their law codes, even to this day, sweep away all feudal property relations and are still, still remnants of his law codes can be seen in every single one of these countries here. And you can see those little arrows, um, Louisiana, Quebec, Haiti, Mexico, Nigeria, I'm sorry, Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, all of those countries have something in their law codes, including all these ones you see here, something in their law codes that they O to Napoleon. So his law code, much like Justinian, is probably one of the things that he is um, most happily remembered for. Now, of course, he's going to do lots of other things that we won't remember him so fondly for, but this, this is the biggie. All right, so when we next talk, we're going to be talking about Napoleon and how he runs this empire he has created some might say, running it down into the ground. I'll see you next time.